A couple weeks ago, we started a, a message series or a sermon series um, called The Mark of a Believer. To have all of us who are born again or those who are uh, walking with Jesus, there's a, there should be a, a mark that we walk in or something that distinguishes us as believers. For um, Paul says in Ephesians that we've been marked or sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so, for that, for, but we've been marked and sealed for, by the Holy Spirit for, on the day of redemption. And so, what does that mark kind of look like? And so we kind of talked for the last couple of weeks about the very first thing that we should be marked with is love. Love should be really the foundation of everything that we do. It is, God is love, and therefore God, everything that God does is, is based and founded in love. And therefore, as believers, as those who follow Jesus, the very first thing that we should do is, is love. And it's, it seems, it's, it's an easy word that we kind of throw out very easily, but it's but if you really look at the foundation or the definition of what love is biblically, it's really not as simple as it, as it, as it seems. And so we kind of talked a couple weeks ago about really the definition of love, the agape love, that unconditional love, and that there are really different, in the Greek language, there's really technically four words for love, um, where the English language only has one, and so the meaning can kind of get lost in translation. But really, like, do I love my wife as much as I love cheeseburgers? probably should say that. Do I love cheeseburgers as much as I love my wife? <laughs> so she's not here. That, well, she's not up here this morning. So what happens here stays here. <laughs> she doesn't listen to me. She <laughs> so, but it's, we lose the translation of love just because we have that one word in the English language for love that that we just kind of like flippantly throw it out, like, oh, I love that movie, or I love that football player, or I love football at the same time as we say we love our wife or we love our husband, and we really lose that translation. But the Bible really kind of, because of the richness of Greek, that we get four words, and the one that, that Jesus continually commands us to do is, is agape love, the unconditional, sacrificial, selfless type of love that God has toward humanity. And so um, we, start, we started with loving God, because the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind. And the second one, is, as like it, is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so last week we started with loving ourselves, because we really need to learn, our, learn how to love ourselves properly before we can love our neighbor. Because, you know, really the, the, I said it many times, I think the biggest problem we have is the fact that we, since we, don't, we love others as we truly do love ourselves. That none, many of us don't know how to love ourselves properly. And, 
and, and it's okay to love yourself. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's not selfish. Like the enemy kind of like twists it to say, if you love yourself, you take care of yourself, you're selfish. And that you're not loving the way God wants you to love. <clears throat> but it's not the case at all. Like we were made in an image of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're a temple of God. Therefore, we have to take care of ourselves because we are the temple of God. So we take, ourselves, we take care of ourselves physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Physically, we exercise, we eat right, we eat, we drink correctly, we keep hydrated. We, we exercise, we rest, we sleep. Like, like I said last week, like, as an adult, you should be sleeping 70, seven to nine hours a night. I haven't slept seven to nine hours since my son was born 13 years ago. And, you know, when you start sleeping, then another kid's born, and then you start the process all over again. And, and so it's, so the proper rest is seven to nine hours, and it's okay to rest. It's okay, like, we really should be working ourselves, working from a place of rest and not a place of just busyness. Like, like we get idle, or we, we feel like we're idle, and then we, then this thing clicks in our brain, like, well, I should be doing more. Like, I shouldn't have any free time. Like, I shouldn't be... Like, I shouldn't, there shouldn't be a time where I can just sit. And that's really not the case, where God really gave us a time of Sabbath. He gave us a Sabbath day, a time of rest, a day of rest. And it's important th that we take that time, that we take that day that, uh, of just complete rest, of, of kind of unplugging, just doing things that you enjoy, doing stuff, and, and, and taking a time away from work. I, I promise you, the world will go on if you take a day off. Like you like, and, and it's really a t it's really a trust thing, where like like you work because you can't afford to live, or that could be the other way around. You you know it's just that like you we have this continual need to continue to work, but God says it's not the way that it's supposed to be. And as a trust, it's it's God. Even if I take the day off, even if I obey you, will you still take care of me? Will you still provide? Will you still? meet all my needs, and God on a consistent basis will, will do that. He'll show himself faithful if you, if you obey that command. It's not a suggestion. It's not like, hey, you know what? You should think about taking a day off. God says, take a day off. I took a day off. You can take a day off. And, and so coming from a place of rest, a lot of us operate from a place of exhaustion, where you, and you expend yourself to a point where like, you're not even productive. You know, I worked in HR for, for very many years, Technically speaking, you only get about four to six hours of productivity out of an eight-hour shift. And, and so, like, let that, and then if you, and as you, as the hours rack up, the less productivity you, you be, less productive you become. Around Wednesday is about the most productive day. Monday, you're recovering from the weekend. Then on Tuesday, you're, you know, you're still semi kind of recovering. And then Wednesday, you're like, okay, I want to get some work done. And then Thursday, and then you're looking for, oh, tomorrow's Friday, then the weekend, and then Friday comes along, and you're like, I'm, I'm checked out. I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my, my weekend. And, and so because we, we operate from a place of exhaustion, if we actually come from a place of rest, how much more productive, productive, more productive we would become. And so we talked about that. We talked about our – and so today we started talking about just the emotional health, taking care of yourself emotionally, that we um, know how to say no. Like we, we ended you know, last week with boundaries of learning how to say no. No is the most, the greatest word you can possibly ever know is no. Like, like you're, you're scheduled all the way to the, and packed. And your days are packed and then someone comes and says, hey, could you, I really could use your help. Can you help me? And it's okay to say, I don't have time. I'm sorry. No. Or I already have plans. No. Instead of this, oh, well, I have, to, I have to do, I have to do, I have to do, I have to do, I have to make sure everybody's needs are met. And, there, and, in the, and in the meantime, you're running yourself ragged, and you're exhausted, you're irritable, you're, you're frustrated, and then you hate yourself because you said yes to something you didn't really want to do in the first place. And so learning how to say no, setting boundaries with ourselves, with our family, with our friends, with those that we work with, it's okay to say no. The only person you cannot say no to is God. God does not allow no, but I promise you that he will never tell you something that will, you know, make you... He'll always cross boundaries because you'll say, well, this is not what I'm going to go. I'm not going to do this. And he says, yeah, you're going to go do it. And so, but he will give you grace and the energy to do all that, he, that he's required of you. <clears throat> and so today, we're going to continue on with self-care and soul care, what I, would, what I would say, or emotional care. And today, we're going to talk about the best thing of, 
of forgiveness. The best thing you can possibly do is forgive. Unforgiveness is really a disease to the soul and to the mental health that you have. Holding unforgiveness in your heart will, will just devastate your entire life. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about just forgiveness, of, of having the ability to forgive. And so I'm going to read you, it's a, it's a longer passage today. It's um, out of Matthew 18. Uh, Matthew 18, 21 to 35. And it's a, it's a parable that Jesus told. And so we're going to start in tw verse 21. And Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was unable to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. But this, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will, tell, I will pay back everything. The, servant, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused and said he went off and had him thrown into prison until he, until he could pay that debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called a servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he, until he, should, be paid, until he should pay back all that he owed. <clears throat> this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. And so, the, so there's a few things that we can kind of draw from this passage and through this parable. The debt that was owed to the king was more than could ever be paid. At that 20,000 or 10,000, um, thank you, at 20, um, how much was it? The 10,000 bags of gold was equivalent to 20,000 days of work. And so it was impossible for this servant to pay the king back. That debt was so insurmountable that even if he could work the entire life, he was never going to pay it back. And, through, and, and so the, the, the servant, knowing this, knowing he could never pay it back, begged for pity, and, and the king forgave him. The king canceled all the debt and forgave all that was owed. And, though, and, and so it was just the picture of a forgiving king of like, of, like, Master, I can't pay it. Will you please forgive it? And he did. And then so the, ser the servant left the king, went and found a, a friend of his that owed him just a tiny amount. A hundred civil coins was an equivalent to like a day's wage. And so the servant could not pay it back. And instead of just forgiving him as he had been forgiven, he said, I, wanted, I want you to pay it back. And so threw him in the prison. And when the king heard it, he, threw that, he brought the other servant back and threw him in the prison, until he, and reinstated that debt and pay, threw him in the prison and to make him pay all of that back. And so what really Jesus was saying is that our sin toward God is greater than anything and everything that we can possibly ever imagine. The sin and the death of our depravity and the sinfulness that we have is greater than what we can possibly think. And then God, in his mercy and his grace, forgave us just because we asked. And so if God forgave you, we need to forgive others. Because there is really nothing that anybody could ever do to you that is greater than anything that we've ever done to God. And so if we could ever, if we would get the understanding and in the, in, in the revelation of the depth of the forgiveness of God then the forgiveness would be so easy for us. It doesn't mean that you've never been hurt. doesn't mean that we've ever never been offended. Never doesn't ever mean that we've ever f faced hardship. It just means that there's nothing that anybody's ever done that is, that is unworth your forgiveness. But it, like I said before, unforgiveness is a disease to the soul. It, it is a root of bitterness and anger. Like I have been around people who have been unforgiving of, of past hurts, and they've become the most angry and bitter people, the most cynical and critical people that you've ever come to. Like, nobody could ever do anything right. Like you could work your tail off, and they were like, oh, well, you should have just, you know, you didn't cut this right. You didn't mow the grass the right, right way. I had, my mom had a friend that every time I, I cut his grass for him, every time I would mow the grass, I had a cut in the opposite diagonal of the one I did the week before, and it was the most tedious thing I've ever done in my entire life. I, you, I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, you spend way too much time on your lawn. But if, but if you, 
you know, I've never done it before, but I made a mistake, and he got upset with me and yelled at me. And it was like, in my mind, I'm like, that's the most, that's ridiculous. Like, it's grass. It's grass. I understand the lawn care. I don't understand lawn care because I don't, I've never done it until we moved here. But it's, <laughs> but it's, like, I understand how important it is to people. But there's, but there's, there's that criticalness of, like, nothing can be done to your standard. And then it's, it kind of runs out, it comes from that place of, like that bitterness or that anger that's, that everything has to be perfect or it's not right. But if we understand the fact that we are not perfect and therefore we can't expect perfection of other people, there's grace that comes. But it will destroy every relationship that you have. Nobody really wants to be around an angry, bitter, critical person. Like when, when there's nothing positive that's ever said, if there's a constant just complaining and constant criticalness, like you notice that people start drawing away because it, it is. It's, it's a disease that just spreads to other people. Like you ever heard that misery loves company? Like you ever been around someone who just, like just complains on a consistent basis and it just gets old just listening to it? But, it's a place that, but it comes from a place that's, that really probably just a place of unforgiveness that they just can't forgive. But it will cause physical health issues, emotional health issues, and spiritual health issues as well. Like I've seen unforgiveness just destroy a body. Because it's that anger and it's that racked up with anger. Like, I have relatives who are completely unhealthy. The doctors can never tell you what's wrong with them, but it's just they're so completely they're under constant pain. They're under constant health issues. It's because they are, their lives are rooted in unforgiveness. I have a, I'm not going to say, but I have a family member who was divorced 30 years ago, and it was like it happened yesterday. Everybody else has moved on. Everybody else is forgiven. Everybody has taken steps forward. But, you, but that, this person cannot move past the fact that, it, that a divorce happened 30 years ago. And so it's like, like it's a life that's rooted in unforgiveness. It will cause emotional issues and it will cause spiritual issues as well. Unforgiveness will also destroy your relationship with God. His forgiveness hinges on the fact that you forgive. Like throughout the New Testament, on many occasions, it's a, like even in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us as we have forgiven others. But, in, but in, even in the passage that, the, that we read in verse 35, it says, This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Forgiveness is condition, God's forgiveness is conditional on the fact that you forgive. That you forgive all that you hurt because if you, if you cannot forgive, God will not forgive you. But you will lose out on heaven if you continue to harbor unforgiveness. That you will miss out on heaven if you continue to harbor unforgiveness. Like, if you have forgiveness, if you have unforgiveness toward others, your sins have not been forgiven. Like, we can, we can beg God for forgiveness all we want, but if, but if he tells you that you have unforgiveness toward other people, then, you, then you, he, will, he will not cancel your sin. He will not cancel your debt if you're continually holding other sins toward, against other people. But, but who do we need to forgive? Like, who in our lives do we really need to forgive? The first, per, first thing we need to do is we need to forgive others. Every one of us have been wronged by someone at some point. All of us have been hurt. All of us have been let down. All of us have been dis- disappointed. All of us have been offended at one point. Like we, but if you experience hurt and disappointment, but there's nothing that needs to be held on to. Like, forgiveness, forgiving others is not letting them off the hook. It's just letting yourself off the hook. Like, I, like so I read somewhere by someone that said holding unforgiveness is like you drinking the poison hoping the other person dies. Like that's what unforgiveness does. For unforgiveness is a poison to our soul. Unforgiveness is a poison to our spirit. Like it just continually kills us and the other person just goes on with their life. But there is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. There are people who you cannot allow back in your life, but you still need to forgive. Like, there are people in my life that I've had to forgive them, but they will never be a part of my life because of those boundaries, because those set boundaries. Like, reconciliation and forgiveness are two very different things. Like, f- reconciliation is always God's goal. Reconciliation is always what God desires, but in, in many cases, that just is not going to happen. For those who of us experience abuse from sexual abuse or abuse down the line, forgive the, your abuser, but don't let them back in your life. Like, it's okay to cut ties. It's okay to cut them off. It's healthy, and it's safe, and God will never tell you to move back in with your abuser, but you do need to forgive, even even if they don't ever, ever apologize. 
that's the hardest thing you would ever do is forgiving someone who doesn't understand the fact that they wronged you. Like you don't need an apology for forgiveness. You just have to forgive. And if that apology comes, you can just say, well, you've already been forgiven. In the courtroom, you see it many times where families or murder victims get up and you see the, the anger and the, and the malice that comes out of it, and it's, and it's rightful, and it's a righteous anger. But in many other occasions, you just say, you hear parents say, I, I have to forgive you. I forgive you. Like, I forgive you. And it, and it takes time. It's a process. But it, it releases you. It releases you. It doesn't release the other person. It releases you into freedom and into health. But we do need to forgive others. But who are those others? Your parents. Like, forgive your parents. Forgive your parents for abusive behavior. Forgive your par parents for neglect or not encouraging. Like, forgive your parents for all the stuff they've done that, may, that you may not have liked. Like, forgive them. Let them off the, let them off the hook. Though. I came to the realization, I was sitting at dinner with my grandparents one day, one night, and I was listening to my grandpa, my grandpa talk to my grandmother. And it clicked in my brain. That's where my dad got it from. And it clicked in my brain that my dad did the best he could with the tools that he had. And that in that moment, forgiveness came. Like I was able to forgive. And it led and, and and when I forgave my dad, it allowed a relationship to be built with my dad because I I hated him before. I hated him before because of all the stuff that he did in my past. And then or growing up, or me growing up without a father. And but in that moment I released myself to allow a relationship to come. I mean, we still don't have the greatest of relationships, but it's still, I can forgive. I can sit in the same room with him without seething. <laughs> like, like it's, but it was almost like God allowed me to see the fact that like, uh, he did the best he could with the tools that he had. Like, my, like your parents did the best they could, could with the tools they had. Abuse is a, is a, is a generational thing that continues to get passed on from generation from generation. They learn it from their parents, who we learn from their, our parents, who will learn from us. And at one point, when forgiveness comes, you'll say, the cycle is going to be broken with me. So in my family, in our family, my wife's and my family, the cycle is broken here. Do I still mess up? Yes. Do I still not, not the greatest of parents? Yes. No, I'm not. I, mean, I think I am, but I'm not. <laughs> my son's sitting right there. He's like, <laughs> but giving, giving my, allowing my kids to see a life different than the one that I saw, that maybe my grandkids could, you know, it continued, the cycle gets better and better and better. And, and so, but, it, but it's, but it, forgiving your parents, allowing them off the hook for the way they parented. The other thing, parents, some, maybe, maybe you need to forgive your kids. Maybe you need to forgive your kids because of their behavior. Maybe they're out of control. Maybe they, they've, like, disrupted your household and they ruined your life, or you feel like they ruined your life. Or maybe you have an unplanned pregnancy that now your entire life has changed and that you're bitter at the fact that now you have to raise a child. Like, there are parents out there like that. Like, there are parents who are looking at their child as the fact that they ruined their life. I'm, as, as you, if you happen to be one of those parents, forgive your, forgive your kids. Kids are a blessing from the Lord. It's a heritage of the king. I, I, it's an, kids are an amazing thing. And when kids act up, when they act a fool, like you have to remember like they are a blessing from God. There are no accidents in this world. There are no kids who come just by chance. Every child is given by God. And so maybe you need to forgive your kids because you hold them responsible for a life that you do not have. Maybe you need to forgive your spouse. Maybe your ex-spouse or maybe your current spouse. Maybe you, because you blame them for the hurt that they may have caused. If you're in an abusive relationship, I would, I would very much tell you to get counseling or maybe even greater, bigger things than that if there's, if there's abuse. But dreams that needed to be abandoned because you had to get married or because of something that, or you got married and you had all these great grandiose plans and now things change because you're married. And so you harbor like these hurt and hurt feelings and confused feelings of the fact that you had to go a different route because you got married. 
the life I planned when I got married is very different than the life that we have. And that's okay. It wasn't Amy's fault. It wasn't my fault. It was just the way that God has it. We were telling somebody last night about the fact that we had a college professor in college. When, we, when Amy and I first got married, our first year of marriage was horrible. It wasn't anything to do with us. It was just horrible. Like, we had two major car accidents. We had all this other stuff. Like, two major car accidents. I just one, two. Like, we became a magnet for people who just ran into things. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, I had to leave school before I could graduate. And, and I had a professor who was very special to me and to Amy tell us that maybe the reason why that things are happening the way they are is because maybe you should never got married in the first place. And this is like four months after we got married. This isn't like, you know, and, and so that stuck in my head. Like the enemy twisted that for the next several years. I kept every little negative thing that happened, I'm like, probably shouldn't have got married. I probably shouldn't. So like, like unintentionally, this unconscious response that everything bad happened, I blamed her because of this stupid comment that was made. And it was stupid. It was inappropriate. And it was out of line. If you knew, if I knew then what I know now, I would have stopped. I'm like, no, that was inappropriate. You need to apologize. <laughs> but I was young and impressionable, and she was my mentor. And I would, you know, and you never talk back to mentors. That, well, that was in my brain. But, and, and so I allowed it to just wreak havoc in my life and in my marriage. And finally, I finally told her. I told Amy after years of, of marriage saying this is the reason why I feel the way that I feel and and I was like you're just not right it's inappropriate and it's it's a lie but this is this is just where it's coming from and I thought it was it was a release and because she asked me she's like do you really feel that way I'm like no but subconsciously it's just this nagging but as I as I voiced it I, I was really I was freed from it and so like the blaming like the blaming stopped like you don't blame your spouse for things that have happened that that caused you to change your route amy got sick and we lost our world missions appointment never once was i angry at her never once was i like i blame you because my main concern was the fact that she was sick she was constantly in pain and it changed our entire life and nothing else mattered at that moment except her ministry didn't matter relationships didn't matter work didn't matter as long because she was my main focus Never once did I say, I blame you. It's your fault. It's your fault. But it was through, but we, in fact, the sickness even drew all us even closer together. And so, and, but it brought us into, it, it took us on a path that brought us here. This was God's intention. Do I think God intended my wife to get sick? Absolutely not. I do not believe that God sends sickness. I do not believe that at all. But he used it to bring, to bring us to a place where we needed to be. But maybe you need to forgive your spouse. Forgive them. Forgive them. Like, we all fight. If you don't fight in marriage, you're not communicating. Like, we all fight. I, 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 it's funny. Like, like, like newly, newly married people, they're like, oh, we just never fight. Oh, I love him so much. Oh, I love him. If you're not fighting, you're not communicating. But I said it before, like, what used to be cute when you were dating now becomes a motive for murder. Like, it's just, like, oh, like, oh, the, it's so cute that they leave the cap off the toothpaste. Oh, that's so cute. And then five years in the marriage, you're like, put a cap on. <laughs> like, like, for me, socks just go wherever they fall off my feet. Amy can't stand it. Like, and like when she walks out of the room and like when, it, you know, she's like, well, you just pick up your, your socks. Then I go into the bathroom and there's like stuff all over the sink. I'm like, you're worried about my socks, but I can't find the sink. <laughs> so, but don't allow small, tiny spats to ruin an entire marriage. Like, forgive. And sometimes things are just not worth fighting over. We've been married for 16 years. Socks are not worth fighting over. Uh, like, Q-tips are not worth fighting over. Like, they're just not fighting. Just pick them up. Like, that's, what, that's, what, that's kind of a rule in our house is instead of fighting over the fact that no one does dishes, just do the dishes. 
Like, just do the dishes. Like, who cares? Like, who cares? Honestly, I, I don't care. Oh, I just got done working 12 hours. So what? You're not off the clock. Like, it's, like, when you're not off the clock when it comes to your family. Like, it's just, you're constantly, I've come home from very long, long days. And my wife reminds me, I don't, there is no room, if you're married, there's no room for spiritual pride. Like, you can do the most amazing thing. Like, I've, I've, I've been in services where I've seen people heal and set free. And I walk into the, into the house, and I was like, I need you to take out the garbage. Like, but you don't know what I just did. I don't care. Just take out the garbage. Like, like, they're, like, wives have a way of bringing humility to your life. Like, like, and that's fine, and that's good, but, like, but we'll operate from a place of forgiveness. And the best advice, marital advice I've ever received was forgive before there's even anything to forgive. I walk into a place of forgiveness to the point that even before there's anything done that needs to be forgiveness, you've already forgiven. Because as, as, as crappy you think your spouse is, just think they have to live with you as well. And so she forgives you, forgive as easy. Or he forgives you, forgive as easy. Don't harbor, don't harbor it. I don't hold on to it. Like I remember 10 years ago on March 15th, like you said, let it go. Forgive. Forgive because it will destroy a marriage. And that's what the enemy wants. It's a scheme of the enemy. In 2 Corinthians, it lit- like Paul literally says, it's a scheme. Of the- We're not unaware of his schemes. We're not unaware of the devil's schemes. And in context, he's talking about unforgiveness. We're not unaware of his, of his schemes because the enemy will tell you what he, whatever happened to you is not worth forgiving. It's not worth, they're not worthy to be forgiven. They're not worthy to be forgiven, and they may not be, but the fact is, is forgiving is for you and not for them. The other person that you need to forgive is yourself. It's a little bit more difficult to forgive us. It's a little bit more uh, difficult to forgive ourselves. We hold ourselves to a standard that's unreasonable. Every little mistake, every little thing that we do, every little sin we commit is the worst thing you can possibly ever do. We are our, we are our own worst critic. We are our own worst critics. Like I've said, I've, I've been in ministry for years. I've been preaching for years. Like, I have preached messages that have been powerful, but I've also preached messages where really nothing, nothing ever happened. But I've preached messages that are so powerful that the whole church responds, and they would say, how did it go? Uh, I forgot to say something. Like, it, it really, it kind of, it kind of sucked. And they're like, seriously? Uh, yeah. Because we are our own worst critic. We know things that other people don't know about ourselves. Like, if you, if, because we say things, well, if you just know my thought life, if you know the way that I think, if you know the way that I act, you will never be my friend. And that might be the case. But forgive yourself. Let yourself off the hook. Let yourself off the hook. Like, when we, when we talk about ministry, like, at the school of ministry, when we talk about, the quali- like, you, like, there's a qualification to be in ministry. Like, not just because you're called, but there's a biblical qualification for those who want to be in ministry, those who want to teach. And, and, the fa- and, uh, we, and I've said it many times, it's like, if we all dug deep in ourselves and understood the depth of our thought processes and our way that we act and the way that we think, we would disqualify ourselves every single time. Now, there is a way, like, there's an outward sin that needs to be dealt with, but there's also just a process of salvation that happens on the in- inside that, that we have to give ourselves grace for. We have to forgive ourselves. We have to f- let ourselves go. Like, a past that was devastated because of sin needs to be, God has forgiven you. Forgive yourself. Like, forgive yourself of a, of a life that just doesn't work out. Forgive yourself. Like, let yourselves off the hook. But we, are, but we see at times a life that was ruined by our own choices. Like, a choices that we've made and sin that we've committed. Like, let your, forgive yourself. Let yourself off the hook. Like, but, we must for, we, but we must forgive ourselves because properly loving yourselves means that you give yourself grace. That you can make mistakes. That you can, make, you can commit sin. But those, I, forgive yourself. The other thing, the other person that you need to forgive sometimes and I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but sometimes you need to forgive God. And this is probably the most difficult one to see. And the religious spirits in us say, well, we, God has nothing in ever to, for us to forgive. But if you resent God for a life that you have, you need to forgive. If you find yourself saying, well, if God could have stopped it, 
If God, God could have stopped it, God could have loved, God could have pushed it away, God could have done that, you need to forgive. But why do I need to forgive God? Because oftentimes we hold God accountable for the pain and hurt that we have experienced in life. I lived with abuse for most of my life, my childhood life. I lived with it. I experienced it. Every form of abuse you can think of, I lived through it. And I remember sitting in a, I, I went through a, a 12, st- I, went, I went through counseling, I went through therapy. Jesus and my therapist were the, only, were the two things that saved my life. Like Jesus and my therapist changed my life and saved my life. And I'd be forever grateful. Like, I still have a relationship with my therapist. She was a pastor on staff. She was a life, licensed therapist. And for three years, she, still, she walked with me through a disaster of a life. And if it wasn't for her, I'd have no idea where, we would be, where I would be. But she made me go through a 12-step um, spiritual healing process that, that, that um, structure like AA is. Like, it was for those who grew up in dysfunctional alcoholic homes and abusive homes. And I, and I went through, it was a hard, it was 12 weeks long. Hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. No, I, nothing, I, I, every time I have to do something hard, I think back to that time. I'm like, I did that, I can do this. And I remember at the very end of it, we had to go around. I, I was really, I don't like to talk about myself. Like, I never did. And, and so, like, we had to go around the, around the group. There was only, like, 12 of us. And the, the facilitator said, I want you to look back over your life and tell us, like, how did it affect your, your view of God? Like, how did it affect your relationship with God? And so it started up because she knew I won't talk. So she started on the other side of the room and walked all the way around. And, we, and you know, I say it's a Christian cliche. It's, oh, it made me love him more. Oh, it made me trust him more. Oh, it made me, you know, blah, 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 blah. And in my brain, I thought, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm picking out every little thing that I'm going to say. Like, oh, I love him more. Oh, I trust him more. And, and you know, and, and knowing deep well, it's all a lie. And, and I remember, like, it was, like, three away from me, and I'm, I'm starting to get nervous because I have no idea what I'm going to say. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And I said, they don't want to hear what I have to say. And he, and he said, for once in your life, just tell the truth. And so it got to me, and, and she was like, now, Kevin, I know you don't want to talk, but what, how, did this, how, how did this affect your, relig- your view of God and your relationship with God? And I said, I said, well, I was going to, cherry pick every one of you and I said but but I said but the God told me that I have to tell the truth and I said and my reality is I don't like him I hate him if he loved me enough to st- if he if he loved me if he was sovereign if he was in charge as he said he was he could have stopped it all like he could have stopped it all he could have pulled me out he could have done whatever and I said I hate him can't stand him I said and when was the last? And I said I have to free, ask for forgiveness for others for times that I've wronged him when he's going to ask for forgiveness from me and the look on everybody's face was like oh my god <laughs> and I was like this is how I feel this is how I feel and at that moment I heard I heard him say finally you told the truth and it was just the weight that was just released I, like, I, like, literally, that was the turning point in my life where I, where I walked in, one, in a room one way and walked out a very different way. Like, I, like, it was just like, I forgave him. I forgave God. And it seems so sacrilegious, and it's just it's this legalistic, religious mindset that we have that God is so far removed from us that we can't talk to him like that. Like, if you read through Psalms, if you read through the scriptures, through the prophets, the prophets held him accountable. Like, where are you? Where were you when all of this is happening? Where are you? And God, in his infinite mercy, continues to deal with us. Like, if you harbor unforgiveness for God, he already knows it. Just tell him. Like, he's not offended by your feelings. He's not afraid of your feelings. He's not afraid of questions. He's not afraid of your feelings. He's not afraid of it all because he knows it all anyway. Just vocalize it. Just vocalize it, and you'll notice that, there, that things change. Like if, we, if we tell, scriptures are clear, if we tell, if you have an offense with a brother or sister, go to them and, and address it. Like if you have an offense with God, go to him and address it. It's a relationship that we have. He's good, I, and, and he's merciful, and he will deal with you accordingly of, of, the, of the honesty that you have toward him. And when I was finally honest with him for that next year, like, it was a year of restoration. God restored my relationship with him. 
like God restored my relationship. Like I, like it was just an most an amazing and impactful time. And it was out of that time and out of that relationship that God recalled me into the ministry. He reminded me of the fact, like you are still called. Like, dude, you're still called. But I walked away from all of that because I couldn't stand the fact that like my feelings toward him. Like, it, like it, it's a it's a block. Unforgiveness is this wall that just blocks all type of healthy relationship. But, but forgiveness and unforgiveness is our responsibility. And so how do we forgive? It's all done by faith. It's all done by faith. If you, if you want to know if you're unforgiving towards somebody, let the person jump up in your mind, and if you're angry at or hurt or shame or guilt or whatever pops up, that means there's unforgiveness there. And by faith, just say, I forgive. Lord, help me. It's, it's a work of grace. It's a work of God. It's a work of the Spirit that, that it's only like just continually saying, Lord, I forgive. Lord, I forgive. I, I forgive my mom. Lord, I forgive my dad. Lord, I forgive myself. Lord, I forgive my spouse. I, there's continually saying it, and then after a while, you'll notice that those things begin to drift off. Drift off. It's done by faith. It's not going to be one mo- moment where you're just like, okay, all of it's done. Like one of the things that I was told was it took you 30 years to get like this. It's not going to take you a day to change it. Like, like it might, it's a process. Salvation is a process. It's, it's, sanctification is a process. It's continually walking to a place that every time something comes to your remembrance and you're like, oh, I could kill them, choose to say, I forgive them. When, when you look at your spouse and you're like, for the last time, Pick up your clothes. Say, but I forgive you. But I need you to pick up your clothes. <laughs> like if, if you want to stay married, pick up your clothes. But operating from a place of forgiveness, like offense is just a, it's a, it's a horrible thing. Like, like being offended. And really, offense is a sign of an immature heart. Like if you're offended, it just means that you're immature. Like there's a level of immaturity. Like there's really should be, like, like the biggest thing that people keep, keep people from coming to church is offense. Well, so-and-so said this to me, or so-and-so didn't come to this, or so-and-so didn't do that. Like, nothing should keep you from church. Nothing should keep co- Like, Jesus is greater than all of this. Like, if you quit, quit coming to church because of somebody, that means that Jesus wasn't your focus. Like, now, the, now the church people say some of the most horrible things ever. Like, like they, it's like it's a practice, like, that church folk get. And, and I, my wife and I have had some horrible things said to us, like horrible things said to us, like things that would turn your heart. But, but, it's, but it's not what we're here for. We're here for Jesus and only Jesus. Like, nothing should keep you away from Jesus and nothing should keep you from the community of believers. Like, that's what the enemy wants. The enemy is going to come and say, what kind of church? The church is a bunch of hypocrites. There are a bunch of hypocrites this church is. We're all hypocrites. If you really want to be honest, we're all hypocrites. None of us are perfect. None of us, we all make mistakes. We all say things we don't mean. We all do things that we don't intend to. We're all hypocrites. But sometimes the person doing it doesn't even know they're doing it. And so that's the reason why Matthew 18 is put in place. That's why Jesus put Matthew 18 in place. So that way, if you're offended, you can go, hey, Linda, you know, I didn't really like it when you said, and you go, well, I didn't know I said that. And you're like, yeah, that kind of offended me. And they're like, then you go, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, like a lot of times, like, I say things out of my mouth. Like, sometimes, especially when you're preaching, things just start, ah. Like, if you're a public speaker, things just come out. Like, you don't really intend for them to come out. Like, I've said things where people say, you know, I really didn't like when you said, and I'm like, I don't even remember saying it. And so I have to go back and listen and be like, oh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> and, and so, but being humble enough to just apologize. But just forgive. Operate from a place of forgiveness. Like, operate from a place that, like, nobody can do anything to you to pull you away from God. And if they do, just repent. Just ask for forgiveness from God and then go and say, you know what, I didn't really appreciate it when you did this. It takes maturity. It takes boldness. It takes guts. It takes the spirit. Like, nobody wants to be corrected. Don't do it in front of people. Don't be like, hey, John, remember when you said, I go... You know, just go and say, you know what, I didn't really appreciate it when you did this, or say that. Like, can you help me understand? Like, maybe there was a misunderstanding. And you'll realize how relationships are just molded. Spouses, God, 
we say, Amy's the only person that can get me mad. I shouldn't say that. My family's about the only people that can get me mad. I don't get mad. I, like, I move past that. Nothing. There's no anger that comes like, like what your spouse can do. Like, there's no, like your spouse knows how to, how to push buttons. But if you just go and say, hey, I didn't understand. Why did you say this? Like, like you notice that those bridges be built. Instead of the enemy going like, yeah, she doesn't love you. She doesn't respect you. Like, blah, blah. Instead of saying, hey, why did you say something like that? Like Amy said, like, why, why would you say something like that to me? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but, but why? What would what, what cause you? And you're like, because I'm an idiot and I'm sorry. That's usually how my apologies go. Like, ah, I'm an idiot. Sorry. God. Instead of just saying, well, yeah, well, you do. That's how the stuff goes. I'm going to operate from a place of forgiveness. And so this week, this week, forgive. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring into remembrance. And I got, I'm, I'm convinced that, there, that just me preaching this morning brought people to your mind that you need to forgive. Forgive. You'll let, they're not letting them off the hook. It's not saying you were okay with what happened. It's just saying that I'm going to set myself free. That I'm not going to harbor any ill will, because if you if you if you want that person to die, you probably need to forgive. If you're okay with that person possibly spending eternity without Jesus, you probably need to forgive. Like there was a moment with, with my parents where I was like, "I'm fine. Heaven without them would be best." But then, the, but then the Lord was like, that's not okay. Like, and then you need to forgive. You need to be set free. And so you just, you walk through that process of forgiveness. You may never, ever, ever, ever get an apology, and you have to be okay with that. So let's pray. So Father, we bless your name. Lord, I thank you. Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I ask that, Lord, through the process. Father, this is the hard thing for us. This is a difficult thing for us. For Lord, we are, we are mortal we are sinful, and Lord, we succumb, we succumb to things that are common to man. And Father, forgiveness is one of those things. Unforgiveness is one of those things that, Lord, we harbor hurt feelings and offense, and, and Lord, we know that it affects our relationship, you and others. And Lord, we ask that, I ask you, Lord, that through your spirit and through your grace, you will help us to forgive. Throughout the week, I pray, Father, that you would strength, that you would remind us of places that we need to forgive, that, Lord, that we need to forgive our family, we need to forgive our friends, we need to forgive our church folks, Lord, we need to forgive ourselves. And, Lord, and when there's areas that, Lord, where we need to forgive you, I pray, Father, that we would walk in that very quickly. Lord, pray for grace. Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for mercy, that, Lord, but also that, Lord, that you would remind us how much that you have forgiven us. That, Lord, that you do it so easily and that, Lord, you do it so quickly. Father, let us operate in that place. Let us operate from a place of forgiveness. That, Lord, even before there's an offense, that we are forgiven. Lord, even before there's sin that was committed to us, Lord, let us, let us operate from a place of forgiveness. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for every one of us. Lord, every one of the people that are sitting here. That, Lord, that you would bless them with your presence, that you would bless them with your grace, that, Lord, you would bless them with your love and your goodness. Lord, restore relationships, I pray. Restore where, needs to be, that, where that is needed. Re reconcile where, ne where it is safe and needed. But, Lord, help us also just to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen.